Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. I'm your host, John Patrick Owatari Dorgan, and with me, as always, is the, the man. Oh, okay. oh, I was man. Give you I, a I real introduction. I, I was going to be like, I didn't, man who needs no introduction. I didn't know you were going like to that. herald me. I, I, thought I, we was, just... I think from now on, I'm going to herald you every episode. <sighs> Can you get a trumpet, too? <laughs> I will try. <laughs> I have I have a I have a train whistle a child's train whistle around here somewhere. <laughs> Would that work? Um, as long as the train whistle itself is shaped like Thomas the Tank Engine, and you blow on Thomas the Tank Engine's face in order to make it work. <laughs> no, but that would be awesome. It's a. It, I have a slide whistle. As that well is a free product here. for you makers of Thomas the Tank Engine. Yeah, you you keep that in mind. Yes. You'll see that next year. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that the one person listening to this is the person who makes <laughs> work, executive decisions at Mattel. at Mattel. So this week we are talking about Henry V, uh, the uh, what year was it? 1944 uh, edition. This is Laurence Olivier's directorial debut. Um, you know, I want. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, well, I, what I was going to say is, you know, what I think they should do with the Criterion Collection from now on. What? Anytime there's a movie that has been remade more than one time, just it, put, ab- they should just include every single version back to back. Oh, that would make people watching them like we're watching them want to kill themselves. Um, yeah, but does anybody watch them the way we are watching them? No, no, absolutely only the, not. Only the because eight this, people listening to this podcast. This is a terrible decision on how to watch them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah. By the way, I found another podcast that does what we're doing, but they don't do it in order. They just jump around to whichever ones sound good. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot of people who do that. A lot of podcasts and a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, Blogs. Fools, don't they know that it's meant to be listened to, or meant to be watched in <laughs> no, chronological order? this isn't even chronological. This is release order, chronological order, order. DVD, DVD release. No, uh, the, the, most of most of those other groups have the names that I thought of first before settling on mm-hmm. Lost in Criteria. But let's not mention any of them, because um, that would be a free plug. Well, let's let's just say that every every possible iteration of a pun on the word collection has been taken, or possibly an alliteration, <coughs> or an alliteration. Yes, that's that's what I found was an alliteration. Yes. yes. Anyway, Henry the enough of that. Yes, this is uh, this is Lawrence Olivier's direct uh, film directorial debut. Though he didn't actually want to do it, I found out. Um, he tried to get a whole bunch of other people doing, uh, including including Carol Reed. Um, I can't think of anybody else. I was going to I was going to list some and sound really smart, and, and then, then you and just then failed. Just yeah. um, <laughs> it happens. It happens all the time. Um, but uh, ultimately, no one was available, or no one wanted to do it uh, because this is actually the first filmed Shakespeare to make money. Um, they don't. And, do they now make money, or is this is it an always? This is not a clear statement I just made. I don't is it know. always a problem for Shakespeare film adaptations that they don't make money? I feel or is it something up until this film was a problem. It was something up until this film. I feel like probably the Baz Luhrmann, uh, Romeo and Juliet made money just because it had Leonardo DiCaprio in it in the nineties. Um, was that was that the one with guns in it? Yeah, that was the one with guns. Well, that's uh, all you really need. Yeah, yeah, just guns. guns. Guns, guns solve all your problems. Uh, that's what yeah. we're, that's what we're talking in, about in America. In this all week. situations. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't research the. Uh, oh yeah, I didn't expect you to. We'll let our audience of yeah. four yes. take care of that. <laughs> hey guys, I'm looking keep, at you. We're keeping making up numbers, but hopefully it's larger than that. But we have no delusions. Okay. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I but I understand why they don't make money. Yeah. Have you ever? Anybody who has ever sat down and watched Shakespeare knows something that is basically my my thought on Shakespeare, which is Shakespeare is one of those things that is great in theory and absolutely atrocious in practice. Yeah. Like, I can't watch it. Like, I like... In fact, when I've read Shakespeare in, a, in kind of an alliterated or uh, illustrated form, you know, where they, they kind of 
tell you what's going on on stage and things like that. I usually find it quite interesting, especially when somebody's explaining the jokes and stuff. But yeah. as soon as I sit down to watch Shakespeare, I it was a life and death struggle for me to just get through this film. Well, that's one thing about this movie. One thing about this movie is that Laurence Olivier knows that. And he tries somewhat to combat that, at the beginning especially. Uh, well, he, he makes it he, seem like a play. Yeah, and... yeah. The whole thing establishes as if this is a production of uh, of Henry V at the Globe in 1600. And because we have that, we have the groundlings reacting, and the first half hour of this movie is like it's filmed before a live studio audience. <laughs> right. And you know what I kept expecting to happen? is I, I kept expecting uh, Bob Hope and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, who's the other guy from Road to Crosby? Insert is Name? It? Yeah. Uh, now I gotta go look it up. But yeah, I kept expecting them to come out and be like the main actors. <laughs> like, is this a comedy? Yeah. No, it, it worked. It like, because honestly, that's the way you sell me on Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's how it worked. And it worked well for them because, um, you know, and it's an accurate representation. The the audience was into it that much. Um, and right. Just and just into it. <laughs> well, that's the thing is... it. You get the impression that really everything I've come to understand about Shakespeare is it's meant to be a very audience, sort of almost audience participatory experience. Yeah. You know, like you're supposed to boo when the bad guy comes out. Yeah. They're supposed to, and, and as soon as you start treating what are essentially a bunch of dick and fart jokes as highbrow. Yeah. Is where the whole thing breaks we've, down. Uh, we've, we've deified Shakespeare, plays. right, and that's and that's why it falls apart. If you just present it, yeah, with let's you know, and treat it like it's something, yeah, something more than just dick and fart jokes, then it, it kind of falls apart. And like, and that's what it happens to it in the film, though. Yeah, is the problem and, is and we start off we doing start off what like would that. actually make yeah. it interesting for me, and then they slowly morph, yeah. and and even like the the first morph is even. Interesting in its in its own separate way, when they start using what are clearly sets, but they're all sets based on like like they look like they're painted like tapestries. So all everything everything's really elongated, and the the stage. It's pieces. Bing Crosby, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Bob Hope, Bing Crosby. I said it was Bing. Crosby. I thought so, but I was not sure. Okay, well I'm glad you looked Sorry. it up and then yeah, interrupted me, too. me. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> People need to know. Inquiring yeah. minds need to know. Yeah. So anyway, the rest of the set pieces in like the second section are are painted, which you know, I like, find a little bit more acceptable but yeah. because you took out the audience interaction and the mistakes, which were kind of the yes. part of the funny part yes. of it. Yeah. The Once guy, you take those the guy out, dropping the papers. Starts, the guy yeah, dropping was, the papers in the first section was hilarious, and the little, yes. the the backstage stuff that they added for no reason was fun. It was silly, right. but and it was if, fun. if it continued like that, I yeah. probably could have found the movie quite watchable. Yeah. When we got into the obviously, yeah. When we got like into backdrop, the live, the live staging on in, it the, got, it was in still, the Irish countryside yeah. of of the war in France, it got yeah. it lost me. It really did. Yeah. Once. Oh and, yeah. And maybe it's just my disinterest in uh, in war movies, but <laughs> well, it's there's all kinds of things wrong with it because. Yeah. I feel like it suffers from, like, again, I've never, oh, not again, but as anyone could guess, never read Henry V, okay? Yeah. No idea. But I'm guessing, based on what I do know of Shakespeare, that he, the actual regular play probably spends no time on it. But, of, the, of the actual battle? Yeah. Oh, no, and, it's, it's a good chunk of the it, battle. Um, it but, does. I see. Yeah. I don't know because, like, usually he kind of like, oh, war's boring. I'm skipping it. He does usually, but at the same time, uh, it's it's a defining moment of Henry V. Uh, of the yeah. Of the so kingdom, so. I don't. Well, see, that's the thing. I don't know. There's so. a good amount in that, though. It is interesting to note that um, over 1,500 lines, which is about half the play, um, excuse me, were cut from the play to this production. Um, How long is the play? Oh. the Play is ridiculously long. It's, it's. Uh, what did Shakespeare do it in? Shakespeare's Shakespeare do it in installments. Shakespeare's histories were dramas. They were they were solid pieces. They were long, and they were grueling. I think is the word you're looking for. 
They weren't always growing. You know, that's that's why you have these sorts of things. The one thing, the one thing about the play compared to this that it suffers, what it suffers for a reason. Um, this movie was actually made at the behest of the government. Yeah, um, I saw that. Churchill uh, and the guy, the guy, the producer used to work. He had wanted to do a Henry V since 1937 when he was working for the BBC, but he never got it off the ground. Um, so when he found himself as minister under Churchill um, he, he pushed for it um, and and got this made and it was made as a sort of hey we're British this is how awesome we are yeah it's supposed to be a um, morale booster right yeah but the issue yeah. I have with it is and I understand why it would be a morale booster yeah but man I would have spiced it up a little bit well that's that's the thing you know Shakespeare and a lot of his histories do suffer because he he edits um and he censors because the people he's producing his history plays for the people actually financing them rather are the descendants of the people he's talking about more or less. Right. Um, I mean that's why that's why for instance the the British the British kings get a uh, the British royalty gets a uh, sort of upper <laughs> upper step uh, in like Macbeth. <laughs> yeah. See, I was they're, wondering. They're I was watching it, and I was like, man, yeah. that's. Yeah. That doesn't seem very accurate. <laughs> but in Henry V, in Henry V, he plays some of Henry V's more notorious parts. Henry V was right. a very bloodthirsty guy. And in the play, in the actual play, that gets stage time. You know, we're, we're but it not. It doesn't get it in the movie. But it doesn't get it in this movie. It doesn't get it in this movie because anything negative about Henry V gets. <laughs> It's, uh, right, because that's in this movie. considered so that's taken as something negative yeah. about yeah, because the British, the king is Britain, and and so we're we're trying. And you know, this was produced around the same time. I think it was. It might have been released just before, or just after D Day. So it was really. It was a time. Was a I thought time. it said it, they. I think they said in the Wikipedia that it like almost coincided with D Day. Yeah, that they were practically the same. Like it was meant to be shown after the invasion. Yeah, like. As they're marching through <laughs> France, maybe, maybe I don't know, <clears throat> but but yeah, I mean this um, this makes a lot of edits, and it makes unfortunately it flattens the play to me. You know, I'm not, yeah, and since I'm I've never British. seen the play, I don't know. Yeah, I've never. I don't seen know it. what it's it. really like. It, but but well, I now know that I probably don't want to yeah. see it because if it's <laughs> three or four hours, if, it, if it's like it. this but twice as long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who man. Yeah. That's that's yeah. a lot to ask. Yeah, and and one of the yeah, you know, once we get down to it when we get to the battle scenes, one of the only points of comic relief is the guy doing stage Irish, Captain McMorris. <laughs> <clears throat> you yeah. know, the the ridiculously purposefully terrible Irish accent. <laughs> yeah, which oh god. He's actually he's yeah. he, he's he's Supposedly, uh, that character is the first, uh, because that's how Shakespeare wrote him, mind you. Um, but that's uh, that's how uh, it's supposedly one of the first cases of the stage Irish uh, persona that has. Uh, how do I uh, degraded? Uh, <laughs> plagued humanity. <laughs> plagued humanity for for the last four hundred years of of the Irish stereotype of, of the drunken I mean he he doesn't quite make it there on the stereotype end, just the accent end. But uh It's but, pretty yeah, close though. But it's pretty close. Uh and that that is unfortunately one of the few the few uh comedic aspects at the end. And that's one thing Shakespeare was very good at was he knew he knew that the bulk of his audience was the groundlings. And he knew that he had to keep them happy, and that's why we have all those subtle little jokes, and you know, right? But that the problem is, is that without, yeah, the but we, problem is, but is we that don't get we, those. Yeah, we, don't we don't get don't, the jokes. We don't get those jokes. So without without doing what they did at the beginning with the groundlings showing us when we should be laughing, and, right? And then when you get the cue from somebody laughing, you start to think about what was said, and yeah. then you start to. And that that triggers in your mind. You're like, oh, I get it. Yeah, that yeah. was a joke. But without that, it's just like, oh, here's some more crap I don't understand. Up oh, here it goes. It's keep. <laughs> it's still going. 
Oh, and yeah. in scene. It's like, ugh, I can't. No, I can't do it, Adam. Is there, how many <laughs> how many more Shakespeare related things are on this freaking criteria? I am sure there are quite a few. Oh, uh, I know. Pretty much, the, bulk... do the rest of them have guns in them. No, no, no. no. See, I'm not no. interested. Though I would guess that the bulk of Olivier's. Uh... Oh no, that's not even true. Richard the Third, Hamlet, are the only other uh, Lawrence Olivier uh, Shakespeare's. Um. But yeah, I, I don't even know how I don't even know how to go about checking the Criterion Collection for for uh, <laughs> for a writing credit for Shakespeare. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not even worth it. It's, no. We'll just find them when we get to them because I'll know because I won't understand and I'll be sleeping. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a terrible laugh, but I loved it. Well, uh, you know, I mean, because you know, this reminds yeah. me of like ah, uh, it pulls me back to like high school English class. Yeah. Like AP English class. Well, if you stuff. if you think this pulls you back to high school English class, wait till the wait next movie. Two episodes from now, yeah, two, two episodes, episodes from now, we get to talk about Lord of the Flies. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but no, which, um, yeah, which will really pull you back. I do want to say, I do want to say that this being Olivier's first film directorship, and him really not wanting to be the director because he looked at like five different guys before finally it looked like he was the only way. Or he was the only one available. Um, he did a lot because he had he had directed stage plays before, and obviously he is he is a longtime stage and film actor. But he really did it even even when they're shooting this as a stage play. He's not he's not shooting it like it's a stage play. He's not directing it like it's a stage play. You know, we've seen we've seen some movies that take cues in their staging from theater. Uh, you know, High right. and Low is one. High and Low that yeah, is our prime scene, example of yeah. Well, is, the apartment scene. You yeah. mean the first half of the movie? Yes, the first half of the movie. The first forty-five minutes. <laughs> yeah, but that is that is a prime example and an expert example of of uh, film. Right, as and theater. if I had seen that in this, it would have helped me just a little bit. Not a lot. See, I actually, I actually admire that we don't get a lot of that, and we don't get any of it really. You know, even well, when we're on the stage, you know, until okay, there is a moment where we start to get that because bet- there's there's a sort of segue between that opening, uh, and and the uh, and the the tapestry inspired sets, in that we we slowly kind of zoom in and start framing it so that we can no longer see the audience and we no longer hear the audience. Because um, he, he eases us out of that first section. And, right. And he purposely tries to do that. And it doesn't really work for me and you because we're bored by the rest of the movie. Uh, yeah, but, and that's the thing. is like What I'm saying is if, if you had had that sort of... What I'm saying is I want it to be a sitcom. <laughs> want, I want... I want... I want... I want single camera... <laughs> Like, fil- a film or stage to film adaptation staging with yeah. audience background. Okay, okay. I th- I think uh, maybe we should because uh, I've never seen a Shakespeare done that way. We should do Shakespeare like that, and not not just not just Shakespeare comedies, but but actually the dramas, the histories too. Yeah, the really really yeah. rough stuff. Yeah. No, I, I I liked I liked that it didn't do that. Because no, it showed I, it showed that Olivier wasn't just set in his ways, you know. He's well, he's, he wasn't just phoning it in. Yeah, him and like, Brana. Oh, I'm just gonna do a. Him and him and Kenneth Branagh are are two of the best Shakespearean actors, and certainly. You mean Bruce Banner? A, yes, Bruce Banner. Because you can't remember names. Um, <laughs> Kenneth Branagh and and Lawrence Olivier are certainly the best Shakespearean actors of the 20th century. See, I was always under the impression that Patrick Stewart was the greatest. Patrick Stewart is Patrick Stewart's up there. Patrick Stewart's up there as far as acting goes. But there, these, those two are definitely the best Shakespearean directors. Um, and I think it, it shows. And maybe maybe I'm just building him up in my mind, and that's why I respect this, because I don't want no, to disparage like, Lawrence Olivier. But, but um, you know. I will say one I do not think that it is him that is the problem. Yeah. In this film, okay? In fact, I do not... I do not... There were redeeming elements of the film. I thought parts of it were quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. Because of the way that transition into, like, from... Like, that transition from stage... 
obvious stage show with audience to full on historical drama was quite smooth and, and very fascinating to watch. Yeah. Yeah, it worked. That well. was quite that was quite well done. It's fact, I think it's the source material. Maybe, maybe. You for know, me, some, unfortunately. Some Shakespeare doesn't work for everybody, and especially when you start cutting things because inevitably you're cutting the interesting bits to some people and you're cutting you're definitely cutting the interesting bits to me and you when you start cutting all of the negative aspects of the king. Um, right. Because all the want, things that were we want probably that. giving him depth. Yeah. Yeah. Making him exactly. a person. Making him a person instead of this. Because you know what I remember hero. from this? I remember tennis balls. Yes. It's yes. the <laughs> only darn thing I remember which from is a, the which is a entire great, movie. A great joke too. And and interestingly, um, I know a lot of people who get really confused by that because they don't realize how old tennis is. <clears throat> really? Yeah. Yeah. Though I I had to research it myself to try and figure out uh, just how old well, tennis was. But tennis tennis is pre Norman invasion. Yeah. Yeah. Of France it's... because they brought it over to England during the invasion. Yeah. And that's where you get wonderful things like Wimbledon. Well, as a as a quick little aside, uh, learning about the history of tennis, uh, which which got the got <laughs> this got me to do. Um, and the difference between lawn tennis and uh, real tennis, as they call it, um, <clears throat> I really want to start playing real tennis. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a precursor to sort of racquetball. You're you're in a room, uh, but the room on the uh, not on the server side, but on the opposite side, uh, has slits in the wall that you get bonuses if you hit the ball into. <laughs> Really? That sounds it's, awesome. It sounds like something out of like a sci-fi film. Yeah, it's really, it's really, it's a much more interesting game. Because uh, other than that, it's basically the same game. <laughs> well, see, I only learned about it because um, for to get my master's in uh, English, mm-hmm. I had to learn about the linguistic history of English. Yeah, and it came up that like I ended up watching a couple different documentaries. One was called like The Journey of English. And then, I forget what the other one's called, but one of them gets really deep into, like, the origin of so many words being French, and tennis being part of it. Because, like, all those words being taken from the French, bringing them over to English, and Mm -hmm. then just butchering that, and then the English just butchering the hell out of them. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, so... All right. So if memory uh, serves. Oh, well that's that's enough. Right. That's enough tennis talk. Now back that's to the enough. movie. <laughs> Thank you for doing that in a movie phone voice. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. That's so one anyway, for... what I was what I was saying about, you know, his, his his directorial aspects, you know, he doesn't he doesn't just set the camera up as it were an audience <laughs> member as as many people filming a stage adaptation might do. Um, you know, lesser people. But the uh, thing is, I've never actually seen that. You're right. You're right. When I see in when all I the time that, I've ever watched Shakespeare, theater, I've I never guess. once seen it. I guess, which is why I have this like kind of deep, secret, hidden desire to see that my sitcom <laughs> version of Shakespeare. Maybe, maybe. You know, he does close-ups. He does inserts. He does voiceovers whenever someone's doing a soliloquy. I've certainly seen people still turn to the camera and do. Asides. You mean do awesome? <laughs> that is. Uh, That's okay. my definition of <laughs> awesome. Right, it's right, anytime a right. soliloquy addresses the camera. <laughs> the the purposeful breaking of the fourth wall. You know, which is what yeah. soliloquies were. Which is Shakes. Which is yeah. Shakespeare. Yeah. Well, asides. At times. Asides are that. Asides. Are asides. Like yes. That. But that's but, that's a purposeful breaking of the fourth wall. Yeah. Is an aside, right? You're going to fill yeah. the audience in on something so that they know. Yeah, what the deal is? But he did like uh, in this we do like the soliloquies, the long single person speeches, are also done, you know, as voiceover instead of as asides. And you know, in a normal stage play, when someone does a soliloquy, they'll turn full on to the audience as if they are presenting their thoughts, and that you know right. that's what a soliloquy is supposed to be, for an extent, to a certain extent, you know, but. You know, the long speeches, I think, in this movie, and I segue into that. Um, you know, I mentioned Olivia is certainly one of the one of the best Shakespearean actors of the 20th century, um, and in that regard, some of the highlights of this movie are like the St. Crispin's Day speech and the other the other times when Henry V is giving a speech 
and and doing that. Uh, Olivia is really great at it, <laughs> and really draws you in the way he presents it. Um, I was already asleep at that point. But you were already asleep at that point. <laughs> good, good. I'm very glad that you were asleep at that point. Yeah, um, I read I read a lot about the St. Crispin's Day speech. Yeah. And I know where it is in the film. Yeah. But I can't honestly say that I was really was still with it <laughs> at that point. <laughs> well, another like, thing... I remember it because I heard St. Crispin a yeah. lot. Upon St. Crispin's but, Day. But, like, by that time, man... <laughs> you were out of it. I had drifted way out. Of, like, I do not even remember what I was thinking about. Well, but another it was not St. Crispin's Day, that's for sure. Another thing you probably slept through, though, was one of my favorite bits, uh, kind of later in the movie, uh, where they did the uh, the horse top uh, duel. Oh yes, um, I certainly missed that. Yeah, there was there was sort of a. Almost a, a joust, but not really. Uh, they were they were fighting with swords on horseback, uh, and it was very impressive uh, because it wasn't you know. Well, they're fighting with swords on horseback. Uh, do I need to define why that was impressive? No, no, you don't. No, <laughs> because it's impressive because that's what they were doing. Right. Um, Add a couple very, like machine yeah. guns and some explosions. Yeah. <clears throat> it was it was well choreographed. We've got a it John was, Woo film. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and that was and that was toward the end, but there's there's that you know that solid forty minutes of just the Battle of Agincourt, which you know is is greatly filmed, and the way it's shot, you can tell it influenced Kurosawa and how he filmed battle scenes. And I'm just not interested in it. <laughs> no, uh, one of the only things that got me interested is after like during it, I started reading the Wikipedia. Yeah, and I guess they mentioned that you got the the the. Um, extras got an extra some amount of money if they brought their own horse. <laughs> yes, yes, I did read that. They made an extra pound a day if they brought their own horse. <laughs> Which I think is just the funniest thing I've ever read. I think it would be less funny if it weren't being filmed in Ireland uh, <laughs> under under British rule. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because no. then it just feels like oh, those Irish. We'll give them. We'll we'll throw them a bone. <laughs> But, right, yeah, give them a pound a day for their for yes. the horse. the The question is, is how much does it keep? Take, how much does it cost to keep a horse circa nineteen forty four in Ireland? I don't know. Were they Were they actually screwing them over? Maybe, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I I assume I assume that the Irish always had horses uh, because cars still haven't made it into the country, uh, and now I'll disparage Ireland. Um, start talking in. Mick Morris's Irish accent. What was somebody mentioned? Oh, I, I lost it, but yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. I'm sorry. Perhaps I distracted you. Yeah, stop it. I'm going to. I'm going to. Absolutely. Please. No, <laughs> something about uh, horses. I, I I don't know. It's a thought I had earlier today, and it's already gone. <laughs> a thought oh, well. you had about horses earlier. Yeah. Was it that uh, horses are pretty? No, no. It was about horses. Who said it? Oh no! It wasn't a thought I had. I remember, but I've been thinking about it. <laughs> it came, it came from a, one of the movies we're gonna watch next. Okay. We talked about what the national <laughs> animal of Costa Rica will be. Oh yes, it's the yes. horse. It's the horse. Uh, uh, I and then I've been thinking about that like all day. Yeah, yeah. For those of you who are not aware, the next film <laughs> we'll be watching mentions horses at some point. <laughs> there we go, and we'll tell you about that later, possibly yes. the next episode. <laughs> Possibly, if you're uh, lucky. You know, since we really don't have anything else to say, I'm going to I'm going to point out that I'm scared of horses. I are you? I have an irrational fear of any mammal larger than me. Like, so a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah. I just it's not it's not like it's it's not like a stupefying fear. I don't I don't like seize up. Uh, I don't I don't have a negative reaction to seeing pictures of horses. But whenever I'm around horses... <laughs> you pee your pants and don't know where you are for three <laughs> yeah, days. Yes. But whenever I'm around horses or any mammal larger than me, I just get I get really nervous. Um, no, it's understandable. I do too, a little bit. Unrelated, do... a horse once spit in my mouth. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I used to feed horses when I was a child. Yeah. We used to... Uh, my babysitter used to drive me and my sister out to, the, out to a farm. Yeah. Oh, man, this sounds weird. <laughs> And we used to feed crab apples to the horses. 
I'm, uh, glad, I'm glad that's how the story. I know. Ended, I thought that I'm was worried. Going to go a weird I'm worried place. about the pause. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I was. I, I added the pause because I was like, "Oh man, yeah. this story is weird sounding." Yeah. Um, one of the things though is you have to feed them with your hand, your with your uh, hand flat, or else it'll bite your fingers off. Yeah. Well, that's. I think. I think part of my part of my fear was that uh, it'll know, bite your fingers off. I know. I know how I would react if something someone tried to feed me or pet my face. Um, and I'm okay with <laughs> I'm okay with doing that to a dog because I I feel like I can take a dog because yeah, I'm bigger maybe, than yeah. it. Um, but but with a horse, I feel I feel like if if someone just started patting my nose, I would want to punch them. So I'm kind right, of afraid right. that the horse wants to punch me. You know, I'm doing that to you the next time I see you, Adam. <laughs> I know you. Are. Um, I know you. Are. So uh, speaking of animals and scary things that happen, yes. um, me and my family went to a Japanese macaque reserve a macaque being a type of monkey okay Uh, Okay. the second most common primate in the world behind us um so and we accidentally made eye contact with one of them (laughs) it was the scariest it was one of the singularly most terrifying experiences in my life i thought i was gonna have to go toe-to-toe with a monkey It, 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 we got to baring teeth and like standing on its, like standing up, trying to make itself bigger. Yeah, oh, it was intense because I wasn't going to break eye contact first. <laughs> you don't want the you don't want the macaque to think that you've let it dominate you. Yeah, exactly. Um. <laughs> so I grinned at it, which made things worse. Yeah, you showed it yeah. your teeth. That's terrible. right. Oh, I know. Oh, I know what grinning means. <laughs> Don't you're think I anth- didn't do that on purpose. You're an anthropologist. I can take you- a macaque. <laughs> the only comes up to well, the only issue is really where the part of my body it comes up to. <laughs> uh, could be that, could have issues. Um, so yeah, that's been monkey bit. talk time. Hooray! As well as horse talk time. Yes. Man, there's not a lot to say about Henry V, is there? Uh, it, it would seem like there's not. Um, no. Um, well, we got to fill this episode yeah. out, man. We got 15 minutes. Shall I tell more stories? No, no, no. Let's let's say that. Um, well, let's point out uh, this was, you know, as we've repeatedly mentioned, uh, Olivier's directorial debut, um, and this was the first Shakespeare movie to make money both in Britain and the U.S. Um, and one of the reasons that no one wanted to do Henry V prior to this, especially as a BBC production... Because uh, it's awful. Not just because it was awful, but because even Romeo and Juliet in 37 didn't make any money. Or in 33, I think. But, you know, <laughs> everyone who had produced Shakespeare prior to this had produced uh, no profits. <laughs> so, you know, this it's was... It's understandable, because, yeah. like, even at that time... I mean, we're only talking about 50 years difference, like... 60 something years. Yeah. I mean, they're. They still didn't understand. Yeah. What was going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's not. Yeah. This is just weird. So, by the way, Google searches for Shakespeare's plays that made. Or Shakespeare films that made money. Yeah. Not an effective. Not a. Not an effective. Uh, an effective search criteria. <laughs> Unfortunate. Yeah, I really want to know. Um, but yeah, no, it, but that, that's what I'm saying is no, they don't make money for the obvious reason they don't make money. Yeah. Because people don't like them now. <laughs> well, no, I mean like people, if they're going to see them, they're going to see them in a theater. Yeah. Not, not, a, not, not the theater, um, <clears throat> where they will get those cues to say, this is something funny just happened. Yeah. Yeah. Or this is something that's interesting. Pay attention to this part. Yeah. Or we get back to the deification of, of Shakespeare, and it's it's a whole bunch of rich people who don't care what they're doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> that would go watch. You yeah. could tell them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, let's just disparage anyone who acts Shakespeare today by, by saying yes. things like that. Not so much <laughs> people who act Shakespeare, but people who watch Shakespeare. Yeah. No. You're no, all there's obviously, frauds. There's obviously still people <laughs> doing Shakespeare and doing it very well and doing it worthwhilely. Um, worthwhily. Is that, can yeah, I, is can that I a adverb word? that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, well you, can, well, you can adverb whatever the hell you want in English, Adam. It's true. I said you it. Know it's a that. word now. Um, well, no. it's it, You can verb it, too. You can do anything you want. I can do it. I can do it. Um, anyway, uh, what was I... I? I started... I really I had don't a know. point I'm when sorry. I started this section. <laughs> I'm so sorry. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, oh, okay. I remember where I was going with this. It ended up, this this production ended up being nominated for Best Picture, Best Actor, Best, all kinds of, Best Director. What did, um, what did he get? What did he get? It did get? not win. He won he, a special Oscar. Yeah, it was like magical, we made this up for you. It was a magical, Wait. we made this up at. Uh, Academy Oscar. Honorary Award for his outstanding achievement as actor, producer, and director in bringing Henry V to screen. Yes. That is, you know what that, that sounds like? They're like, we did not give you yeah, anything is, for this, but we got to give you something for this. That is the most gratuitous worst, uh, use of the word Belgium in a serious screenplay. That is, that is the sort of award he got. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, and, and I, I guess it's good that they acknowledge that. You know, he's well, like but that it's that it's time. that thing is like, yeah, but I don't know. They must have just done it because, oh my god, he did it, kind of thing. Listen, listen. To be sure, I think we can look at the Oscars and realize on their surface that they're masturbatory. Um, well, yeah. So. I so know I that I masturbate when I watch them. <laughs> I not, didn't. That's not what you meant? I didn't need to know that. But uh, I might I might remind you that tomorrow night the Grammys are on, in case you get. Oh, that's not masturbation <laughs> material. <Ugh>. Okay. Grammys. <laughs> Filth. All right. All right. That's like watching the Peach Bowl's Choice Awards and masturbating. <laughs> what kind uh, of scum do you take me for? Man, this worst. is the worst, the worst podcast time. we've done. Yeah, probably. <laughs> anyway. No, I just don't have anything to add about Henry V. Yeah, it's really, know, it's, we're in a Beauty and the Beast situation. Beauty and the Beast, at least we started reading too much into it. There's really nothing in <laughs> the That's true. Like, oh God, that's the problem. Yeah, the point, the point... Um, the point trying to be made by this one is very straightforward, and we've already covered it. It was it was a piece of propaganda, you know. It, it was, was it was propaganda when it was made, and it's propaganda now. Yeah, it was morale boosting. Hey, we're British and we're awesome. This is a story about when we were awesome before, so let's go be <laughs> awesome now. And I understand why. Have they I wanted showed to you my awesome this? Yeah. I wanted. I understand why they wanted to do that in forty four. Britain was not in a very awesome position. Um, before D-Day. Uh, but, but frankly, this is the British we're talking about. They'd do that even if they weren't in a bad situation. <laughs> Maybe, yes, of course. Hey, I'm that's, talking to you British listeners. That's the, the history of Britain, is always, hey, we're awesome. Let's hey, check British. out how awesome we are. You, you, you're British now too. <laughs> yeah, want to be awesome with us? Too bad, you're not British. <laughs> okay, well, you're not fully British. We're, we're the awesome British. You're British, but you're not British. You're, we're, we're you're not the awesome part of British. You're, you're Commonwealth British. Right. So, British, but not awesome. <laughs> yes, British, but not awesome. We're still awesome. You're not. And we'll shoot you if you try to decide <laughs> against that. Have you seen my rifle? Yes. Well, actually, it's not a rifle. Not yet. <laughs> well, no, not at this point. It's, it's just a uh, tennis ball. <laughs> and that's how the war was won with tennis balls. <laughs> with tennis balls, Agincourt, they just started launching tennis balls and all of the French archers and everything. You know what I think the problem with why people don't understand that tennis is that old is because you imagine not it's not the racket. The racket's fine. Yeah, it's the fact that the modern tennis ball seems incomprehensible as something being old. Yeah, it's, it's so not. it's so uh, it's so artificial. In its yellow yeah, fur. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And that's yeah. why people can't deal with it. Yeah, exactly. It's, like, yeah. like we imagine we imagine this box of tennis balls that, that King Henry V gets. Being uh, like the, uh, what, what's as the As this, name? like, the iridescent. <laughs> what's that brand that makes tennis balls? I forget what they're called. Uh, Tiffin. Like, yeah. isn't it Tiffin? Like, uh, the maybe. tennis ball? I don't, I don't know. think it matters. But, like, a little tube. Like, you open the box and it's just a tube of tennis balls. Yeah, pen is pops a little, like, seal on it. Yeah. Like, like, just a box of Pringles packages. Um, just full yeah, of tennis it's, balls. So, yeah, I'm sure that's... I mean, and, and even I... Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. yeah, and obviously obviously that's not what they were or what they were meant to be. Though we never get to see inside the box, so they probably didn't even have tennis balls as part of production. <laughs> that's the British government for you. Per, per, per tennis balls were a rare commodity during D-Day, okay? Yeah, probably. All tennis ball productions were rerouted towards... Militarized tennis balls. Well, to be to be fair, I think most tennis balls were were produced in Vicky, France. So the Germans had uh, had all had the all tennis balls. All Actually, them. I think it's probably a rubber thing. Frankly, 
I bet you're right. I bet you'd be hard pressed to get eight anything ball. I like I like how we've imagined not uh, we we've imagined that tennis balls were rare, and then decided to justify why they would be rare. Well, it <laughs> makes sense though. Everything made yeah. out of rubber during uh, during World War Two was rare. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. There you go. Damn Krauts. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I I'm sorry. Are For there all of any our other listeners? Are there any other uh, European countries we should uh, make fun of before we, we finish this have episode? We made fun of the Belgians because we've we've not said we've not said anything about the Italians. Um, no, we haven't. Yeah, but we have armor cord for that. Yeah, most of Eastern Europe we've not covered yet. Uh, yeah, but they're scary. I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> Portugal. Um. Would you like to make fun of Portugal? I can't see. I I can't think. Of but how any. do we tie it back into Henry V? Yeah, I I think we'll have to wait for that to come up organically later. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you got anything else to say about Henry V? I, I really, really I, I really don't. Um, people, if you like Shakespeare, and yeah, the worst go part is, it. I do like Shakespeare, and I I yeah. recognize why this is good. I recognize what <laughs> makes this good. Uh, but like it, 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 it's but I'm still again, bored by it. Shakespeare is great in theory. Have we have we had any other movies we've watched so far where where I've recognized that it's a quality work but still not liked it? I think so. Um, what was it? We've well, Beauty and well, the Beast certainly. I think we both recognize no, that. No, 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 not not the quality of the not the. And I just I just put this one up online this week because that's how far ahead we're recording. Um, but. Uh, I recognize that the Beauty and the Beast was very influential. It was very visually stunning. Um, that their their makeup and their artistic direction was amazing, but the story itself terrible. Uh, so I didn't like the movie, despite so much good about the movie. And I think I think this has a similar, you know, you said it before, but this has a similar feeling to that to me. Visually, this movie is great. They make a lot of great yeah. decisions. Uh, it's acted by and large I phenomenally. Actually, I feel oh, like, it, in actually, that's been kind of the story of the Criterion Collection for me. <laughs> There's been a lot of things where I'm like, okay, I really get why this is important. Yeah. But in the okay. actual practice of watching it, it's just... It's not working for you? It's just, it's just grueling most of the time. It's like... Yeah. I, okay. I can see why somebody sat down in a theater... 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago and saw it and said I want to be a filmmaker. Yeah. Because I saw this and this was amazing. But then when you sit down and you're watching it in your living room and you're like, it's a really nice day outside. Hey, is that a bird? I wonder what time it is. I wonder what we're going to eat for dinner tonight. Yeah. Oh, wait. Henry V just said something. Uh, it just doesn't end up working out yeah. in practice. And I think... Uh, we get into something that also I think maybe in the theater it might have been a slightly different experience. Seeing it with other people? Yes. Again, well, certainly, we've had that problem before. Certainly, certainly seeing this one when it originally came out would be a wholly different experience than seeing it now. Not just right. because seeing it with other people in a theater well, I, would make it's a difference, definitely but because, because of the cultural mentality at the time. You know, this right. being you've produced. got the cultural mentality. Also, I was reading that like because of its... Technicolor, mm-hmm. and how powerful its Technicolor was. Yeah, it's very. That it would I mean, have that's... shocked people a little bit. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't really mention that. Let's let's ruminate on that for a second. Um, it is shot in color in forty four, yes. um, which is is not the norm at that point. And it's, it's Technicolor to, uh, but not tech not Technicolor to the colorization extent that we get, but still pretty vibrant, pretty pretty out there in a lot of the ways. It's it's color, especially during the parts where. Um, where the backdrop is more tapestry esque. Yeah, you you get yeah. some pretty pretty nice <clears throat> colors. Yeah, and, and they very, work pretty well. It's very I bright think. and and it pops a lot. And I I recognize how that would be impressive too. And obviously, living in a world where color film is the norm, um, I can't I can't see that as as impressive as with I mean color television is the norm. It's like, you know, at that at that point, anyone watching television wasn't watching color. Uh, 
color moving images weren't exactly a normal thing around you. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I I recognize that, but yeah, I was still bored. Well, and, I mean, yeah, they, and it was like we talked about a little bit. It was a kind of a pretty film. Yeah. yeah. Not the prettiest we've seen. Yeah. By any means, I don't think. You um, know, I'm just mm-hmm. ultimately, I think I'm just a groundling. And you know what I like about a Shakespeare play are the dick and fart jokes, and there weren't yeah, enough in this me one. Me too. Um, and so maybe what have that we makes learned me... today? We need we're somebody un... highbrow to join yeah, us on this we're, podcast. We're arguments. uncultured swine, you know. But yes, we already I knew am. that. We already knew. Yeah, that. Yeah, I've already I've already offended several nationalities. Yeah, we knew that straight up. That's you know, and that's why we're doing. And this. if and if if anybody has listened this far to this <laughs> podcast, they know it too. Yeah, of course. Well, right. I think that's about it for Henry V. I think that's about it. I need to stop clapping. Every so often I clap, just kind of You change. also pound the table sometime, I think. I, I, uh, maybe. Because anyway. I hear a thum, 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 I get, thum. I get Or are you very, playing bass drum? I, I get very emotional Are you playing bass drum? I'm not playing bass drums. I don't have any bass drums here. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> we are so sorry. Um, for this one, I think I think you really deserve an apology. Uh, yeah, we talked maybe about, you should just skip this one. Oh, we talked too about, late. We talked about my irrational fears. We talked about Pat getting in Monkeys? a fight with a monkey. Uh, we talked about... And despite not having tails, they are still monkeys. Yeah. Which is a rare thing. It's, uh, that's fun to know, Pat. Thank you. Yeah. Well, usually one of the Hallmark... Eh, never mind. <laughs> Pat, let's, let's not get into what makes him a cocky monkey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am fine Are you with sure? not knowing Is that, that anthropology and paleontology time? I am time? super, super not interested. But let's go. <laughs> All right, that's the end. We're finished. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Next time we're watching a television series, actually. Uh, the first uh, that we've experienced on the Criterion Collection, though I don't know if there will be a last. Uh, the 1990- <laughs> yeah, I like how you're like, it's the first, but it's not... It's the first, but, uh, but wait, I, have I have no idea if there's true. more. Uh, John Lurie's uh, produced... Uh, Is it Lurie or Lurie? Lurie? Because it's, it's L-U-R-I-E. I can't say names. We know that. Well, no, but I don't know how to pronounce that name. Is it Lurie? Before we, sounds like a cosmetic Before we record that ex- episode, if you could look that up and, and correct yeah. me. Uh, John Lurie, uh, Fishing with John, a television series where he goes fishing uh, with Jim Jeremish, uh Tom Waits, and a whole bunch of other people. It's very interesting. <laughs> Willem Dafoe. Um, yeah, Willem Dafoe's in there. Uh, but it's a it's a great little Dennis piece, Hopper. and we'll be talking about it next week. So join us, and we actually enjoyed that. I think. Well, I did at least. I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's. Uh, let's yeah, get don't into that. speak for me, Adam. I won't speak for you. Thanks for listening. Pat will speak for himself in the next episode, and we'll see you then. Bye. Yep, see you then. to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.